Yeah, so um, uh, this is Craig, I'm Milan, um, and we are going to talk about the United Nations um, and uh, a project that we did together. Uh, is it a project? I think we could even call it a program, uh, <laughs> a transformation initiative. An endless transformation, I would call it. Uh, endless. So, um, right. So, uh, yeah, I will just, um, yeah, we called it uh, modeling an enterprise because we, that's what we tried to do. Uh, it has this um, uh, idea to generate a digital strategy out of it, um, which we, I think, are also on our way to, to achieve. Um, just a very few words uh, on us. Uh, we are EDA, we are the organizers of this little conference, and uh, we are a consultancy uh, on strategic design which means that we do everything that you can possibly do in that space um, and uh, try to bust all the myths that uh, our customers have about us, that we are, for example, intranet specialists because we do that, we are product designers, brand designers, uh, web designers, mobile designers. Yeah, it's true, but also not because uh, we, we do not have all the competencies in-house, so we are working with a lot of freelancers to get uh, everything ready and you see some some projects and um, we have this tendency to to seek the most complex and challenging and uh, difficult projects um, and uh, I can congratulate Craig that he's among those uh, <laughs> who qualifies for that <laughs> so yeah and uh, just a, a little uh, introduction for to that complexity to that domain complexity that we had to immerse ourselves uh, into for this project, uh, Craig is talking about. We'll be talking about um, what this specific part of the United Nations is up to. Thanks. Just by way of introduction, I I come from way back uh, industrial design background, but since the beginning of the web, I've mostly been in, in, um, working on information system design, information architecture. So that's kind of my perspective, but I've got a much broader role in my organization, uh, including uh, knowledge management as well. This is what we don't do in my organization. Uh, with all respect to the humanitarians, uh, and I worked in that field for 10 years, we are not an organization that responds to emergency uh, at all. And there's a very big industry uh, responding to emergencies, which has grown up uh, perhaps to the detriment of, uh, of uh, prevention. Our motto is disasters are always bad. We should avoid them always. Okay? They don't have to happen. An earthquake is not a disaster if buildings don't fall down. Okay? A cyclone is not a disaster if it doesn't kill anybody. It's a disaster if we're not ready and we're not uh, prepared for it. So just a little bit about my world. Uh, disasters, you know, we all see them on the news. They're horrible and they're, they're catastrophic. Um, as I just said, we're not, we're not here to talk about how to fix that. We're, talk, we're here to pre prevent that. So we deal with risk. This, I don't know if you know this, this is La Bolle. Beautiful beach on the west of France. Uh, I was pleasure of being there last year. It was partially caused by a tsunami. We don't know that anymore, but there have been uh, uh, 34 tsunamis in the last 400 years in France, and there's going to be more in the future. So risk, fundamentally the risk here is very invisible. So that's our first kind of conceptual framework. We're dealing with an invisible subject. We're dealing with not the heroism of responding to something that horrible that happened that everybody can see. We're dealing with an invisible subject and trying to make it visible as well. So big disasters like this, this is in Venezuela. This is a, la a massive landslide that happened about 15 years ago. And of course, it's on the news and everybody's like, oh my God, look at this. Where did that mountain come from? But this is a little event in Nepal then unless you were on the road that day and missed your appointment, missed your business opportunity, missed whatever you needed to do, you would never ever hear about this. The point is, 
we call this intensive versus extensive risk. And the real point is that more than 90%, more than 95% in most cases of loss, disruption, and economic uh, loss is caused by these small events that nobody ever hears of. It's not the big ones. It's the small ones that make up the majority of our risk. We also deal with mortality versus economic loss. Of course, if there's a disaster a, a thing, everybody's worried about their friends, their family, and it's, it's a terrible thing. But the reality is that we're doing a pretty good job. These are not great graphs, but we're doing a pretty good job on mortality globally. It is decreasing. Uh, we're doing a much better job in this. Uh, it's, it's going down every year. But economic loss is hugely on the rise. Right now, <clears throat> we estimate that direct loss in the 21st century is 2.5 trillion. It's much more than we thought it was. Every year, there's a $180 billion hole in the global economy going to disaster loss. $180 billion is not insignificant. And the last uh, concept I want to talk about is direct versus indirect, because we, we always think of this, you know, the event, and then we forget later about it. But uh, this is a little story which is indicative. This is the port of Kobe, Japan. Kobe has always been a very prosperous port. It was one of the first international ports to open in the 1800s in Japan, and uh, very, uh, very successful. But in 1985, Kobe had a major earthquake, if you remember, and it destroyed most of the city, killed about 5,000 people, and destroyed the port. But Japan, being extremely resourceful and, and uh, an economically strong country, rebuilt the port. And this is the port again, rebuilt, no problem. The issue is that before the earthquake, it was the number three port in Japan. Now it is the number 19 port in Japan. The business moved away, and it's not coming back to Kobe. This port is basically, I've been to Kobe many times, this port is basically empty, and the business just moves away. So the indirect cost, in spite of insurance, rebuilding, everything else, is huge. So we had to kind of build a, you know, in my domain, okay, build an information system. So we, this is uh, about six years ago. So we, we, we studied and we did our user-centered design approach. We use a, a technique which is generative research, very good uh, methodology called mental modeling. comes from Adaptive Path in San Francisco uh, to look at the task analysis and the content mapping. How can we b build information systems for these people? And we built this, okay, we had to build a website. So we built this thing called Prevention Web, which basically kind of aggregated what we know about disaster risk reduction, and in doing so, we, we basically modeled the domain as, on an evidence base. We modeled the domain, which was a very flat landscape with no kind of ontology or no real taxonomy of the domain, and as we built this site, um, we modeled it, and uh, we built quite a, a large system, and it's been fairly successful. We, in our domain, it's, it's a growing domain. People are starting to understand it more, but we have about 40,000 people that use this system more than once a week regularly as their, as their kind of information source. But after a few years, we did uh, a, an evaluation. Uh, yes, it's, it's, it's the place to go, but it's not enough. It is this website thing is the place to go for information on disasters, disaster risk reduction, but it's not enough, and they were told, uh, our main recommendation was like, become a more active knowledge broker. And, um, and uh, so we did, uh, we uh, took off in that direction. We did, uh, first of all, we had to figure out what knowledge brokering is. Uh, and we, we got involved in a very good, um, this is a crossover domain, but how many people here know about K-Star? Anybody? Okay, this is a, another crossover domain, but then the knowledge brokering domain or the knowledge management domain, part of it is evolved into something called K-STAR. It's written K with an asterisk, which is uh, an encompassing term for knowledge transfer, knowledge translation, knowledge brokering, um, 
all of those things, that means how do you get stuff from a website into people's brains, mostly. Uh, we did our, our more, and uh, the pivotal point and uh, segue in this presentation is that I met Milan at an information architecture workshop, and I was quite fascinated by the ability of enterprise architecture to help us dissect uh, the extreme complexities of our domain and when we took off on a project uh, um, with Milan that he will we'll talk about in a second. But basically we're in the middle of several levels of transformation on this and I wish I could tell you they're all successfully finished, but they're not. Um, we had to build, it was a bit of a chicken and egg thing, we had to build a library for people to see what the domain looked like and model the domain. Now we're trying to turn it into a platform of participation by all of the actors. Um, we have a level of participation. We're trying to go open social on this. Um, it's a global project. We, you know, the globe does not speak English. We're looking, and the globe is working, uh, for example, in Iran, there's lots of resources in Farsi that nobody can find. Uh, and uh, we're trying to be the go-to place for that. Um, we built a lot of lists, and there's a lot of stuff that's buried and not discoverable. And to top it off, we have a global framework. It's called the Hyogo Framework. It was developed in, in Japan uh, for countries. All the countries in the world have agreed on a framework. But the framework, just like you may have heard of it, the climate framework, it's ending in 2015. And we're in the process of developing a new one with all the countries in the world about, OK, how do we build a new framework for this domain that we can measure ourselves and measure our progress. So, um, so uh, when we came in, um, uh, well, we discussed and uh, looked at the website and uh, the website of the agency, uh, the UNISDR uh, agency, which maintains the other website, Prevention Web, and tried to make sense of all of that uh, with the intention to make something, you know, like a plan or a blueprint or um, something that makes sense uh, to apply what we know, like customer-centric, user-centric, um, enterprise-wide holistic thinking. But basically, the models that we have didn't work so well. Um, mainly because it's not entirely clear who the customer is in this case, for example. There are nations, there are parliamentarians, uh, civilians, um, uh, NGOs, uh, Red Cross. Uh, if, you, if you want to prevent, uh, if, if you want to make a safe school, uh, for example, teachers are very important um, and so on. So very complex uh, already in that one um, aspect. Um, and if you know our model, that's basically the actors aspect. So we're looking at who are the actors in that ecosystem, how are they related to each other. We were looking at, um, um, we, we were basically doing what we always do. We go through our model of 20 aspects and we think, well, what might be important? What might be less important? Um, where we, do we need to do research? Where do we need to do modeling? Where do we do, uh, need to do prototyping? What are the aspects that are relevant? And without going into detail there, um, we, uh, we usually see an enterprise or an ecosystem as something very complex, like this cube. Uh, you can turn it, you can look at it from different sides and applying the different aspects. You can try to make, uh, for example, a business model canvas or a customer journey mapping, or you can uh, do things like that. Um, but usually, um, the whole thing is too complex, so you have to take out little bricks um, and uh, look at things that are connected in some way and find out uh, yeah, wha how to move forward and how to, make, uh, how to have the discussions that are meaningful uh, to the stakeholders. And um, yeah, we basically started doing that in uh, collaborative sessions uh, with me painting in, on my uh, computer with this pen in paint. Uh, paint is for us a very, very important tool. Uh, because we can project it and we, while we are talking and discussing we are making up models um, like the ones on top and then later we, we moved into an architecture tool 
called uh, Archie, which is an open source tool. I can recommend, but uh, more on that later. Uh, we produced loads and loads of models to get uh, to the point where we might uh, need to go. And um, just one that uh, got a particular attention was this one, uh, where we tried to uh, look at the, uh, at the challenge and at the ecosystem and the, uh, the basically the, the role of uh, our customer um, from a branding and identity point of view. So we were asking, yeah, what are your brands? What are your identities? And they said, yeah, oh, well, here's uh, UN ISDR, that's us. But yeah, we can't always use the UN because people don't like the UN and there are other actors. So there's a version without the UN, it's called ISDR. Uh, we are using the Hyogo framework of action, which is published uh, using the GAR and discussed on the global platform conference. There are other conferences, um, there are community systems. Uh, we have a campaign called Making Cities Resilient and uh, My City is Getting Ready. We have an award called the Sasa Kava Award. We have the Step Up campaign. We have the Safe Schools and Hospitals Initiative. Um, yeah, we are doing the World Conference. We have the Prevention Web website. Uh, we have the whole idea of disaster risk reduction, which is in itself some kind of identity uh, that needs to be established. And while we were doing this, um, this whole mess kind of emerged. And um, yeah, and, and, and this picture actually got very, very successful, right? Yeah, I just want to make the point. In, in, the, in the UN, and like many of people who work in private enterprise, even though we've been kind of trying to get the point across about what is a brand, what is brand identity, you know, there's very extremely low level of consciousness about this in organizations like mine. Um, but this diagram really helped. The senior managers absolutely for the first time saw themselves in this diagram and went, oh, oh, yeah. And uh, my boss said, yeah, a bit of a tough cognitive journey to make sense of our identity through our brands. It's not fixed, but at least we've got a step towards recognition that maybe, maybe as an organization of 150 people, maybe we have too many brands. Yeah, and uh, also what you need to know is that you are, if you are in the domain uh, of disaster risk reduction and you are um, in touch with all of these actors, you are not only in touch with UNISDR, you are in touch with many, many other, even many other UN organizations. Um, there is the UNDP development organization, there are other huge entities inside the UN and then all the NGOs, everyone, and everyone is doing that too. So uh, you, you can multiply this uh, by times of actors, and there are many actors. So, um, and the question is, is, is that an effective uh, way to establish um, a, a, a transformation worldwide that aims to lead at uh, less dead people and less economic loss, um, throwing just so many brands at people so that you basically um, uh, uh, you can't get you, you don't have any chance of recognition really except that you rely on on the UN identity which of course everybody knows but then again um, uh, the brand guidelines uh, for the UN uh, they date from the, we, we got them from you from from the early 60s and they are written like a law the emblem, uh, it's in French and, 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 and English, and it's, um, it's the, the most uh, yeah, weird branding guidelines I've ever seen. Um, so, um, and, and has not changed since the 60s. Um, we also then tried to uh, make composite models that look at more um, how everything fits together. So we had for example, this one uh, on top is the digital interaction channels. We have a model that takes um, the um, uh, that takes the value chain of of this organization uh, from raising awareness to implementing uh, resilience. We have a service-oriented approach in the middle with service lines and services at each stage, and try to determine the. Uh, um, what the websites are doing and what the brands are doing at each step, how that then adds to the va business value and who's involved. Um, we pretty, uh, you might see that this is uh, something that we created in uh, uh, a fancy application called Adobe InDesign. Um, but we pretty soon got to a point where the semantic complexity and the questions that we got and the discussions that we had presenting this um, D didn't move us forward anymore and the constraints of that model 
uh, which was built by using uh, our little framework and, and look at what might be important and how can we map it to each other. Um, we, we, we got to a point where we said, okay, this tool doesn't help us. We need something that helps us appreciate the complexity and uh, model everything um, in a more sincere and a more interconnected way. And this is where we looked at uh, enterprise architecture um, as a way of uh, dealing with complexity and um, started doing a little bit more ugly models, but uh, that um, um, are done with using this uh, semantic modeling tool. Um, so this is, for example, a model that tries to cover the ecosystem of UNISDR. So you have UNISDR in the middle. Um, you, it's part of the UN system. They talk to governments. That's their main relationship, um, regional, national, local level. Um, they also talk to the private sector uh, because companies help with that. And then you have all the others. You have citizens, teachers, media, academics, NGOs, the Red Cross. This is something you can't build as a designer, of course. You have the customer who tells you, yeah, the Red Cross is so important, you should list it here. Um, you have things like networks and uh, champions and contractors and donors, which are terms that don't make sense if you are not familiar with the domain, but if you are into it, then they are very, very, um, they, they speak a lot. And then uh, we, of course, Archie, implementing the Archimate language is not made for this kind of model. It's made for a model that, um, that you can map a business and then map it to information systems and uh, make, make a classic enterprise architecture model uh, trying to implement something where you already know how the business is supposed to run or mapping existing uh, mess. Um, and we, we, are, we were trying to map existing mess, but we had different objects. So we had, um, uh, we had user-centered stuff, like from the mental models that uh, Craig showed before. We had things like personas that incorporate some actors. So you have uh, um, uh, John the teacher, uh, and John the teacher is trying to do something, like prepare his school for, for being more resilient for, for tsunamis, because it's at the coast. And uh, perhaps he's uh, coming to Prevention Web, which is a touch point. Um, implemented by a website. The website fulfills con uh, functions and has some content. Um, here's a little technical stuff. But then also that task is actually um, supported by a service. That service is uh, represented by a brand and uh, implemented by a business process on the side of uh, UNISDR. The business process is then uh, done by some organizational unit at some location. And of course, uh, in the end, the service is uh, supposed to contribute to some outcome which maps to some metric of the organization which might be something like um, more national governments have implemented uh, laws in their countries uh, to build resilience, for example. So this is a very interesting point at this, we're in the friendly environment of this room, this may make sense. Uh, uh, we, we showed at one point a senior management meeting this and it terrified them to think that somehow their strategic vision could be codified into uh, uh, something called a meta model and that you know they were like oh my god I'm just a piece of a machine and uh, they they immediately just really we got a lot of pushback and 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 it was to the point of like Wait a minute, who are you to tell us that we're part of a meta model? You know, I'm the manager. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was interesting. So uh, advice, do not, you know, use these diagrams uh, 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 casually because they were extremely helpful for us, but extremely terrifying to certain managers in our organization. Yeah, uh, learned that the hard way. Um, we nevertheless continued mapping um, we made models uh, in the beginning when, when, we th when we were starting this process, we were thinking that yeah, the business process model will be kind of uh, uh, well clean and nice because it should be uh, something that an organization like the UN knows uh, how it's doing its work, who's doing what. So we have things like uh, yeah, the uh, 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 department HR and administration is doing the HR process of recruiting people. 
yeah, that's right. But then there are other things like um, tasks like um, managing applications, websites, uh, connecting people, publishing documents that virtually everyone, every single department is doing because it, it's, part of, it's a different perspective on the same problem. They are creating brands uh, and websites for their own products. Every department is doing that. Um, and uh, so the business process of, of maintaining websites, for example, or creating brands, if you want to name that a uh, business process, um, is done by everyone, every single one. So we had lots of everything to everything mappings. But nevertheless, um, Archie has this uh, nice feature that you can, after you build a horrendously complex model, you can look at one single entity and see everything that is connected to it. So we have something like the task of developing analysis indicators, which is a very important task for um, coming up with risk models and uh, communicating and, and analyzing risk uh, for basically all levels and all, all instances. And you have every every service that relies on that, you have every um, uh, department that is doing that, um, and you have uh, the bigger business process that it's uh, related to and, and adds to. So, um, yeah, it, it's uh, actually a tool for self-discovery. This was really interesting for us because it sounds very obvious after you map it, but um, this development of indicators, this in our business, we, we developed, okay, how do you know, you know, you've got a safe school, uh, what are the indicators for that, you know, uh, um, how do you know you've got a resilient city, what are the indicators for that, how do you know you've got a resilient business, what are the indicators for that, and in fact, it, it sounds very obvious, but we did not realize as an organization until we mapped these processes that almost all of our business processes are around, centered around the development of indicators and, their, and then self-assessment mechanisms because we, we're not the police. Countries and cities self-assess themselves. Uh, so the development of indicators and, uh, and self-assessment methodologies was widespread in our organization from private sector to parliamentarians to the UN system uh, to cities to countries to regions uh, even within our own domain of information management, we had developed indicators. But until we kind of put it together, we didn't realize that, hey, this is what we do. We develop indicators, we develop self-assessment, and the organization didn't kind of see itself until we mapped itself that everybody's kind of doing the same thing. And that's, uh, I think, a perfect segue into service design because this is a service we are de designing and developing we have every reason to design it consistently and effectively across all of the different instances instead of in isolation. Yeah, so um, we, we use this kind of modeling to identify services. Um, so we have services that is kind of obvious, uh, like um, that uh, the, you are interested in a certain country, so uh, UNISDR should give you information on what's going on with respect to disaster risk reduction in a country. For example, I looked up France and I looked up Paris and I can say uh, that uh, in the event of some of the hazards, um, there's not exactly a perfect preparation. Um, others uh, like Sweden, for example, are excellent in almost every respect. Um, and um, yeah, so the service of country information, providing country information to curious people like me, but also people who need it professionally, um, is a service that is um, then uh, serving a certain point of touch points. And if you know Archimate, you know we are severely abusing all of the entities because uh, they, it's, it's actually really not uh, supposed to be that meaning for this little icon. But we thought, yeah, that's a good icon for touch points, so just let me take that. Um, we have uh, the brands that are associated to that, and we have the processes that uh, are used to provide that service, and we can inquire further into the system and look at who is doing that process and so on. But in the end, um, what came out is a service model uh, of some identified services. It's a mix of we looked at the model, but we also looked at what people told us, um, what they want to do, uh, people in the ecosystem, people in the organization. Then you have, of course, political and uh, strategic um, uh, services that you just put on the model because somebody important wants them there. Um, but in the end, you have, you have these service lines, you have um, 
services, and these services are what we need to facilitate with our digital uh, means, like websites. So um, where's the design in this? The design came in by looking at those service lines and saying, okay, how could we do that? And um, we are not only good at uh, stealing uh, methods from enterprise architects, we are also good at stealing from everybody else. So we looked at how, what, what if we do it like the BBC? Um, the UN, for example, has this problem that they make a lot of events, but they have the problem that you, uh, one worldwide event in Japan won't have impact so much in France, for example. So could we do something like a disaster risk reduction X in Paris? Um, could we uh, adopt very much or adapt very much to, to certain roles in the ecosystem? Or could we do something like Open IDEO to uh, facilitate the process of preparing for risk? And so the, the, the model, this model of the identified service lines then informed uh, uh, the, the inspiration, the, the uh, vision that design can deliver. It could be like this. Of course, this is not so fancy like uh, we, we saw in the opening keynote by Anne because we, we actually didn't uh, collaborate with the so in this. We, we, we just made screenshots. Um, but uh, it helped very much uh, inspire a lot of strategic thinking. Yeah. <laughs> um, we then went into a, um, a design mode, but that was very much informed by the enterprise modeling exercise and by the strategic discussions that we had with, with strategic management. We made a lot of sketches, um, uh, conceptual sketches, but also sketches of rendering elements like uh, websites and deliverables and so on. We then produced mock-ups. We returned to paint and, uh, for example, painted this kind of target brand architecture of a shared meter identity. Um, that then could be used everywhere and uh, ha support recognition. So proposing solutions. We also proposed solutions like to things like um, that there are so many websites that have, uh, people have difficulty to say, okay, why, why is this on that website and this on that website and how are they related? So things like common header systems, common navigation, getting really into the design, but from a strategic viewpoint and backing up this kind of work with blueprinting that again was um, uh, informed by the enterprise model. So taking a service, some service, like uh, providing country information and putting on top uh, exper experiential uh, dimensions like people and tasks and current pain points and potential delights um, when dealing with, uh, with the UN or with, the, um, with other actors uh, that are involved in delivering the services and then taking our services, mapping them to this experiential dimension, and then looking at the, uh, basically, um, the business architecture um, from a digital point of view. So what capabilities do we need to provide in order to provide the services in order to satisfy at maximum our people? Just an example, uh, you are coming uh, to, um, to, to you and ISDR and you have no idea, no clue what it's about. So the service that we need, need there is orientation, provide orientation. This is disaster risk, this is what we do, this is what, why it's, it's important for you and this is what you can do. Um, and then beginning to draft the story on top. Um, really a story, it's not a blueprint in the sense that we want to uh, have something like a customer life cycle on top or something, uh, well, generic like that is a story of one specific persona having one specific journey and then uh, trying to design the service for that persona. So really uh, adopting the, the design thinking mindset on top, but then going very generic and very structured and uh, almost hardwired at the bottom when defining the architecture, which we did not do yet really. So <laughs> that's why it says draft and XXXX stuff. Each blueprint then would have mock-ups and wireframes. So this is um, how we think enterprise architecture and uh, holistic design can come together um, when everybody is doing what they are doing best. So yeah, we're in the middle of this now. We're we're templating. We're doing designing each service individually, but you know there's there's it's like 
four transformations trying to happen at the same time. Our organization is still extremely publication-centric. We have something called the Global Assessment Report, and you know, and our mentality is how many times do I have to bang you over the head with this report till you understand everything in it? And almost nobody reads it. Yeah, and almost nobody reads it. It's excellent. It's the epitome of our knowledge, uh, but nobody looks at it. So we're trying to transform the organization from thinking publication, like just wait till 2015 and you read our new book, it's going to be great, to the conversation that's happening now. And that's a big transformation for a, a kind of bureaucratic organization. But we're, you know, slowly introducing, you know, design, responsive design, all kinds of new uh, patterns almost by stealth, a little bit more, um, a little bit more modern. We're really doing that. We've been, uh, uh, lately, uh, we have a very big kind of communication blitz to try to understand uh, or to try to help people understand that this is, in fact, a big transformation, uh, visible, social, responsive, discoverable, and... Uh, and we have um, started a transitional design, which is taking us out of, um, of the, the thing. It's not our real design, but it's transitional because we've been forced corporate to show change. Uh, the, you know, this doesn't scare anybody. This makes them happy. The research behind scares everybody, so we need to do that. One thing we have done, and it, again, it's transitional, is been able to kind of unbrand some of our brands by giving this type of navigation that that at least puts them on a, a non-competitive, non-political uh, playing field. It's not a final solution to a branding problem, but it's, it's a strategy that's at least got us uh, to the point the organization decided finally that it does have a corporate presence and a domain presence and it didn't really think it through, but it just finally came to a final conclusion on that. At least we're, we're there. And basically, here we are today with a transitional strategy on top of a, a transitional design strategy on top of service development, on top of a organizational transformation strategy, on top of a need to actively broker knowledge better which is much bigger than, of course, a digital strategy, but it's all part of our domain, and I hope you uh, enjoyed our little world on, uh, on this. The good thing I, is I can just give us some time for questions. <laughs> Who has questions? Who has answers? Thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is, um, you just said uh, you unbranded some activities, some brands, uh, in order to make it more functional and uncompeti uncompetitive. Um, how did they react? Because maybe it was part of their identity and the competition was like uh, an energy they had to develop. Um. It, so far, it's working, and we're adding this to all of our uh, digital properties, and it's being accepted. Um, the strategy I use is like, steal from the best. Like, look at the Google thing, uh, uh, you know, that takes you to its different properties. Of course, they have a brand family, and they have a better brand identity strategy than we do, but it was kind of like, well, Google did this, so it's okay. And everybody's like, oh, I guess so. Um, and uh, so far it's, it's working. Uh, there's not a lot of low-level harmonization yet, but it's, a, it's at least an attempt that on each of the, the properties that you can get in a generic way. There's no big fighting on, you know, real estate, homepage real estate or anything between the brands. And uh, it's uh, so far so good until, until it's not. But <laughs> 
The, actually, uh, I, I should say that our CEO, our head of organization, called a uh, undersecretary general, um, actually made a comment at a staff meeting two weeks ago saying, but these two new brands are not harmonious with each other. And I'm thinking, wow, oh, finally, somebody. <laughs> it's, it's entered at least into a level of consciousness. It's not fixed, but they starting to understand that brands uh, and, um, and digital in general is, is in fact, the, uh, and like I, I really like this inverted triangle diagram, is like what everybody outside the organization sees. Inside the organization, they do the real work and the website is like, oh, that's something else. Outside the organization, the experience is the digital strategy. It's the same thing. <laughs>